Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Noon, and I am the chair of the Ontario Forage Council. And I'd like to welcome everyone here today for our third um, uh, and final webinar of the Forage Focus series. Thank you to Dairy Farmers of Ontario for their generous partnership in this year's webinar series. We really appreciate the support of the DFO. I'd like to thank Kubota Canada Limited and Ontario Sheep Farmers for sponsoring all three webinars. Please take a moment to visit kubota.ca to see how Kubota can help with its range of solutions to fulfill your forage making needs from tillage to seeding to crop care and forage harvesting as well as material handling and beyond. So thank you Kubota. Today's webinar is brought to you by Growmark Inc, SGS Canada Laboratories and Belle Isle Sil Solution Nutrition Inc. Today's session is called Hitting the Bullseye on Forage Quality. Our presenter, John Winchell, received a degree in dairy science from The Ohio State University, has been practicing dairy nutrition for more than 20 years. John started with Alltech in 2016, working as a practicing dairy nutritionist. For, oh, sorry, John, John started with Alltech in 2016, working as a territory manager in New York. He specializes in forage quality dairy nutrition, and mycotoxin control. John currently resides in Buffalo, New York with his wife, Jody, and three children. I'd like to turn it over to John at this time. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Terry. I appreciate it. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate the time and I can't tell you how excited I am and how happy I am to be a, a part of this meeting today. Um, I know the Ontario Forage Council does a lot of great work. You look through the information on their on the website, and yeah, I even went back and looked at GoForages.ca and looked at some old school information that was just awesome to look at, and kind of in some research for talking about this topic that I love so much. Uh, this is something that really is kind of the direction I've gone in my career. Looking at forage qualities kind of changed my life, and. And I think it's actually an excellent, excellent part to, to work on. Uh, every farm can work on it, obviously. Um, I live just outside of Buffalo, New York. Actually, I live on the ridge over top of Lake Erie um, in Eden, New York. So actually uh, from my house, I can pull out of my driveway and I can see Buffalo, I can see Lake Erie and, and um, obviously Ontario. And actually at certain times, if you go right up the street from me, I can see all the, um, uh, the windmills out down in Southern Ontario. So I'm over top of you. So actually I'm, I'm really pretty close to you. So I feel like I'm almost uh, an Ontario person at heart. So, but it, like I said, it's great to be here and we'll keep on a going. So obviously one of the biggest things we look at is is we want to hit forage quality. Everybody wants to make the best forage they possibly can, but sometimes as we go, we kind of just shooting around uh, the bullseye because of mother nature and everything else that goes on. But then there are times when sometimes we can make the most perfect forage and either by accident, but we know there are some people out there that seem to have that knack to get lucky every single year and hit that bullseye over and over again. And I think I, what I'm going to do today is probably talk a little bit about ways that we can maybe be, hit that bullseye a little more often. Uh, one thing that we do know is, you know, how the cows eat and everything that goes on with the cows. Cows are, they really don't lie, like it says here. They really can tell you how that forage quality is. We've all fed some of that later first cutting uh, that they just kind of balk at a little bit or we feed diets to the cows and they end up giving it to the heifers. So, you know, we've all fed those kind of feeds. So we know cows don't lie. And the one thing I really want to stress is that really mother nature is pretty much undefeated. It's pretty hard to get around mother nature. There are some things we can do to tweak, um, but looking at the weather forecast, we've all done that before whether it was in the newspaper, on the TV, now on your weather apps, we've gotten a lot better at predicting weather, but obviously living in Western New York and, and most everyone there in Ontario, we know how the weather changes 
in a heartbeat because we're sitting around these uh, lakes. So it is interesting to try to take care of. But what we're going to try to focus on today is obviously hitting the goal on forage quality. I'm primarily going to talk about, about haylage today. Um, I could do a whole session on corn silage. And actually, I do a lot of work on farm looking at forage analytics, looking at how customers can take their haylage and make it the best. And then also with corn silage, we can look at how we can make it the best. So I'm going to kind of talk about what I look for on forage tests to kind of identify that, why digestibility is so important to me, um, and then look at phenology a little bit, harvest timing, kind of give some examples of what I've seen in Ontario and realistic examples, and then also kind of summarize it a little bit. Um, Christine, can you run a, a, the poll for me? Yes, I can. So okay. John's got a couple of questions just to get to know you guys, his audience a little bit better. So the first one is how do you decide when to harvest haylage? Um, and as soon as you see that up on your screen, please uh, put in your answer. Your options are, do you use the date on the calendar? Do you inspect your field and make your decision that way? Um, are you asking yourself, is the crop tall enough? Or are you going by the weather forecast? Is it going to rain? Okay. So how do you decide when to harvest haylage? Overwhelmingly, 84% of respondents said that they do an infield inspection. 12% uh, say they check if it's going to rain. 3% cut based on the calendar date, and 1% is checking to see if the crop is tall enough. So John had one more question. Did you want to do both of them now? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, one more question about how you guys manage your haylage and how you think about it. So this one is, what is the most important thing to look at with haylage quality? Is it crude protein, neutral detergent fiber or NDF, yield, or fiber digestibility, which is NDFD. So what's the most important thing to look at with haylage quality? 55% of you said fiber digestibility or NDFD, 25% said crude protein, 12% said yield, and 8% said neutral detergent fiber or NDF. Now that you've got a better sense of our audience, John, I'm gonna pass it back to you and, and let you continue on with your talk. All right, I appreciate it, thank you. And I, I'm really happy to see the, the numbers and the way they shook out uh, by looking at number one, us looking at the in-field maturity of and the stage of the crop. I've been to many places and talked to many people where their, their grandfather say chopped on or mowed on May 20th for first cutting, their dad did it and they do it the same way. And you know, that'll work every once in a while, but not very often. There's so much extremes in that. So we have to look at the quality because there's so many different dynamics to that. And then as for the second question, uh, all of them could be correct, depending on your situation on farm. If you're using a lot of alfalfa, then obviously I know a lot of people look at a combination of NDF and crude protein. And obviously yields pretty important in, in any of the equations. When you're looking at grasses, you're, you're going to probably lean a little bit towards NDF and NDF digestibility for sure. And we're going to talk a little bit about ways that, you know, might explain that a little bit more. Let's see here. So I always look at forage as kind of the final frontier. Um, Every farm we go to, every supplier that seems to come in the driveway will always ask us to be more efficient. And I know as an industry, we're probably at times get sick of hearing that be more efficient, be more efficient. But I go to a lot of dairies, uh, I've been to a lot of dairies in, in both the US and Canada. And one thing I can say for sure is that uh, forage quality and bunk management, in my opinion, is the, grit, the last great efficiency in dairy, because I think that no matter what farms we go on to, I did a real good silage audit uh, last week in Vermont for a great dairy, and it was just amazing looking at their forage quality and how they make their forages and how consistent their forages are from year to year. And But yet there were a few things that we could tweak 
to kind of make that even better. So I think no matter what farm you are, you can be doing a great job, but there's always things that you can kind of improve on a little, but yet we always want to make sure we're chasing that quality. If you were um, involved in the, the talk a couple days ago with Kendall, um, it was a great talk about baleage and baleage, failage and garbage. I thought he did a great job on talking about quality. But as we know, um, what we do can be pretty frustrating and a lot of these things are out of our control. So 18, 19 and 20 were all kind of tough years no matter what you did, it was pretty strange. Uh, but actually anymore, it's becoming very common. So one of the things as a nutritionist that I've always thought of and actually one of the first days on the job as a nutritionist years ago, uh, one of my mentors from Ohio, he said that every year you can start off new. And I kind of think about that more and more and more because every year, every spring is a clean slate. We get to start and make decisions on when we're gonna be planting our corn, when we're gonna harvest our, our uh, fall annual crops, when we're gonna be harvesting our haylage to get started. So we're all kind of in control of that and kind of hitting that bullseye is what the goal is. We always can kind of shoot around it, but the idea is hitting it. So. As we talked actually in that poll question before, what is your goal? I mean, is it crude protein? Is it RFV, RFQ? Is it yield? Is it NDF digestibility? I mean, I think it's a combination of both. And I think we can hit kind of that sweet spot in between to hit that bullseye. And like I said, it depends on the forage type. It depends on the goals that you have on the farm. And it also depends on inventory. There are some years if we're pretty tight on inventory, we sometimes will wait a little bit longer to make feed because sometimes we might be out of feed. And I know the last couple of years for haylage, most people have been pretty tight on forage. And it also depends on if you're going to do, if you're going to plant any of these fall annual crops like rye or triticale, because you want to make sure that your corn date is a little bit shorter because you want to not make things too tight. But when we look at crude protein, obviously we know crude protein drops very rapidly, especially in grasses, really, really quick. So trying to hit that sweet spot between quality and yield is actually what my goal is and what I try to work with on dairies is to hit this optimum goal so we're not too early and not too late. When you're looking at RFV slash RFQ, I look at RFQ a lot more uh, when you are using, utilizing grasses or fall annuals or summer annuals or cereals, I look at RFQ a lot more because that takes into consideration more digestibility than what RFV does. RFV has been around for years. Um, it's really good for alfalfa, but it is not quite as accurate and as dynamic for any of these grasses. So a lot of times you'll look at the RFV and the RFQ and there'll be times when the RFQ is really, really high, but the RFV is low, and it's just because of that digestibility. So primarily that those situations are grass. So we want to shoot for that one, really that 150 to 200 range on, on forage quality. And if you can get higher than that, that's fine. Um, but there are some potential limitations in that as well. So when we look at cows, uh, I've from a farm and around farms all my life and I'll be on farms for the rest of my life. And we know that in NDF will equal intake. And so it's basically like a bucket filling up, filling up things with a bucket of water. You're going to want to make sure it's full. So we're always constantly fighting this battle of the higher the NDF, the lower the energy. So we want to try to get that balance in the rumen of, of basically physical fill and what we're getting out of those products. We wanna make sure we get that balance just right because we wanna keep that rate of passage going. And we'll talk about that a little bit along here too. Um, so with NDF, obviously, and if you have a real high NDF, typically you're gonna have a low NDF D30, which is basically the fast form of digestion. And then when you look at UNDF 240, these are numbers. If you haven't seen these numbers before or the, these labels, these are, are very important that we are going to be looking at these for years and years to come. So we'll identify these a little bit. But if you have these three things, usually the cows are telling you something will be a little bit wrong. When you've got a lower NDF and a high NDF D30 and a, and a low UNDF 
240, that usually is not a bad thing. And that usually makes good feed efficiency. And usually you'll have pretty high intakes with this as well, because it's kind of a winning, a winning propo proposal. So I always like to look at this real quick. This is something, this is some work that had been done by, by Rick Grant in, and Mike Van Amberg back in 15. We were looking at NDF. So if you look to the column to the left on NDF, this is six different corn silages. If you look at them, they all look pretty much the same, I would say. When you look at the lignin, they all look pretty much the same. But then, whoops, right here, when you look at the NDF D30, look at the big difference between all those corn silages, even though on paper, when we were just looking at NDF, they all look like the same forage. So that's why there are times when we feed certain feeds where the nutritionist brings us the feed sheet and looks, we look at the forage tests and it looks just like the other ones, but some of them just way outperform the others. And there are other reasons for that, but primarily looking at this, it's, it's NDF digestibility. And when you look at this, we did a lot of, used to do a lot of research with, with uh, utilizing lignin. And that's why RFV worked so well because that lignin number was pretty tight on legumes. But then if you look here at grasses and corn silage, they can range from one to 7.2 in these numbers, which is the lignin times 2.45, which was the way we figured diets for years and years. So that's why it was so hard to get everything worked out and the rations were so mystical and, and sometimes took a lot of magic to try to get them to work because we didn't know the dynamics that were there. So it makes a big difference with this 15% difference. That is seven and a half pounds of milk when you look at the, one, at the NDF digestibility from the one feed to the other feed. So seven and a half pounds of milk, which is gonna be three some kgs, that's, you know, that's quite a bit difference in milk. So when we look at NDF digestibility, this is a chart that I put together back in 2016 that looks at NDF D30, which is a faster form of digestion. That's how much of the NDF is digested in 30 hours. If you look at the top two yellow lines there off to the left, 68, that's BMR corn silage, 58, digestibility is regular corn silage. Then we start looking at your grasses. Then we start getting into mixed and then get into your full alfalfa legumes. They are not as digestible. The leaves are very digestible, but the stem is, excuse me, the stem is not. And that final yellow bar there on NDF D30, that's, that's straw. So that just shows obviously straw we know is not that fast. If you look to the, to the graph in the center, that's UNDF 240, and we're gonna talk about this here in a minute, and then we're gonna keep on a rolling. But you can see how much, how low that UNDF 240 is on BMR, how low it is on conventional corn silage, and then you see those numbers just rise up. This is where our intake is involved. This UNDF 240, as we find out a little bit more, that is what controls the rate of passage in our diet, of how fast that feed moves in from the front end of the cow through the back end of the cow. That's why it's such an important number because that's showing how much is actually undigestible of that NDF that they're eating. So we know that NDF equals intake. And then we also know there's a certain percentage of that that they're gonna utilize and not utilize. And that's why it's important to look at these numbers. Um, and we'll keep on going. But this is basically what we're looking at now. We're looking at really fast digesting forage. And then you've got middle parts and then you've got a part of the forage that's indigestible pretty much on a long point. When you look at NDF D30, that's kind of what I consider my gas. When you look at NDF 120, that's kind of the breaks, that's kind of that middle. And then when you look at the UNDF 240, that's basically the, the feed that is in the lab. They will test the UNDF of the diet and that feed will sit in the lab for 10 days. And if it's not digested in 10 days, we all know it's not gonna get digested. So that's the part of the feed that isn't get digested. We're also now starting to look at NDF 12. We're looking at 12 hour because we know that certain grasses and alfalfas, those super explosive ones that similar to the samples that uh, Kendall was showing on his 25 to 29% alfalfa, those would be super high in NDF 
D12 because they would be super, super fast. And then they kind of slow down from there. But when I look at UNDF 240, this is a simplified way to look at it. But to me, it's the best way to look at it. If you look at UNDF 240, that is what you are spreading in the field or that is what the cows are putting in the gutter. I mean, it's a little more difficult or complicated than that, but honestly, this is, this is how we should look at it. This UNDF 240, the higher that number, the less the cows are gonna eat. So we've done a huge amount of research in this with the UNDF 240. Uh, Minor Institute uh, just south of Ontario has done quite a bit of work on time budgeting for dairy cattle. And one thing that we do know that the at most cows eat three to five hours a day and then they have the lying and resting times, 12 to 14 hours a day. And then they're, they're, they're bumping up against each other, moving around, um, jumping on each other, just different things that they're going to do socially. And they have this time budget every single day. So one thing that we know, if they aren't going to be eating three to five hours a day, hopefully they're lying down and resting. And they should be ruminating when they're lying down and resting. But if we're in an overcrowded situation, for example, like in a lot of the herds are in the States, if we're overcrowded, then they're either going to be eating or if they're short on bunk space, then they're going to go back and lay down. They're short on water. They're not, there's just a lot of different interactions. But what we're starting to find out as an industry is that particle size, which we've all changed particle size through the years, going from long to short to long to short to long to short. Then we also look at the at UNDF 240, which is what basically gets spread in the field or gets put into the gutter. These two parameters are pretty important because if we're overcrowded, we only have a certain amount of time to eat during the day. If we have really long particles that the cows have to chew down to basically ruminate, or we have super high ND, UNDF 240 diets, basically real woody forage, if we have a real woody forage or we feed what I'll call blown out forages, we are, they're going to spend so much time chewing that they're going to actually be taking away the time that they're going to be doing other things. So this is where I see a lot of herds. When I troubleshoot them, we look at it and if they're overcrowded or the stalls are not in real good shape or feeding times are off or, or bunks, are, aren't maintained right, we run into a lot of time where the cows are not performing like the ration on paper says. And some of this now I feel is a lot because of particle size and the, the UNDF 240 or a combination of the two. So it's interesting to see that you just have to sit and think about it for a second. <coughs> I won't spend much time on this, but when you look at this, this graph was done back in, I think, in 2011 um, by, I think it's shot. And you can see here the graph in front of you. It says feed size. They cut feed to a certain amount of size, whether it was long, long rye grass, rye grass cut at 50 m uh, millimeters, hay cut at 19, hay at 8, at 1.18, and then silages. And you can see the different sizes. But look at the bolus size. That's the bolus size of what they're chewing and swallowing. Everything ends up going down to primarily about that same size. Everything that you see in those yellow boxes from no matter what the size, the bolus size ends up being the same. So what we end up doing is, is if we've got some real rough forage or really long forage, they're going to have to chew and chew and chew to get that down. So that's one of the things that's interesting. And if you look at the bottom uh, quote that I have down at the bottom, that eating time was very dependent on the digestive or the NDF levels of the diet. So if we have a halage at a low NDF that we got it in a real vegetative state before anything headed out, are, obviously they're going to eat more than that. And then if we have something that's a little blown out or, or headed out like crazy or, or a lot of bloom, then they're not going to eat as much of it. So it, it all makes sense. And it's looking at this physically effective fiber, which think of that as just length. And then the UNDF 240, think of that as what we're spreading in the field. Now we're starting to look at, Rick Grant's group has done a great job at minor looking at PEUNDF. And I guess you, know, you don't need to worry about the, the, the terms and the numbers as much, but it just shows that when we look at these, it's this, 
thing between length of cut and digestibility of the forage. And if you look at the work that's been done, it, you can see easily when you have a high PEUNDF and what, what it does to dry matter intake. And then you can see what happens with milk production. They're about the same graph. So they, it's amazing the work with me doing nutrition for the last 25 years and troubleshooting on farms. This is just such great information because it's things that I've known for years, but a lot of times we couldn't quanti quantify it. So it's just super interesting. So to kind of pass that, oh, talking about NDF digestibility, I do a lot of on-farm work on looking at harvest analytics, looking at times when we're cutting our haylage and also times when we're working and harvesting our corn silage. And the way I look at it to hit the bullseye, it's not just looking at the weather on your phone. It's going out into the field. It's looking at multiple things and tying up multiple things together to get it just right. So that's what we look at. When you look at the dynamics of Ontario, there's multiple dynamics on Ontario. When you go to the southern, southern end, I'm using this for corn heat units, but this is a great graph that kind of shows the, the areas that, that we get for temperatures in the different part of the part of the province. So you can see how it's different. And you know, obviously there's a reason why the majority of the dairies are in the one area they're at. And obviously when you look at Wellington, Perth, Oxford, um, Waterloo, right around those counties right here in Southern Ontario, the temperatures seem to be pretty consistent. And obviously the growing degree days are all right. And I think we're far enough south here where we get a pretty good even season. And that's interesting to see. Uh, so when looking at different things, and this might be a little small to look at, but this is looking at Ontario um, in in not 2106, in 2016 and 2017 for haylage and small grain samples. The one thing I want to focus on is you can see the protein there. You can see the ADF, the NDF, and the NDF digestibility, which I have highlighted in gold. Uh, you can see where corn silage is around 56, NDF D30, grass haylage is 58, mixed haylage is 52, legumes 49. That's because of that stem because you have a lot, once the leaf is gone, you've got that stem to deal with. And small grain silages are, are still in that 56. These are numbers that we have to increase. We have to lower this NDF number and we need to increase the NDF digestibility. And by, by chopping a little bit earlier or mowing a little bit earlier, depending on the year, we'll be able to capture that. So when we look at uh, like triticale for, for instance, uh, in New York and Ontario from 2016 to 2020, why do we have such good numbers? If you look at this, you've got 33 dry matter, 14 crude protein, 54 NDF, and 65 NDF D30. So that's 65 NDF D30 compared to the previous slide where the average for small grains is 56 and for haylage is 58, and yet this triticale is at 65. Well, number one, triticale does a, is a pretty good feed and it is pretty digestible, especially if you get it right. But a lot of times there's the, the triticale is under the gun because we've got to get it off to get corn onto the field if we're double cropping. So since we're under the gun, we have a tendency to try to get that off as quick as we can. And normally that's going to be a crop that we pretty much get in first every year, that or rye. So looking at phenology, which is basically, phenology is just a big word for what happens in nature. We all know there's migrations. We know that every year we start to get leaves on trees. We start to get, you know, the dandelions come out, the flowers come out. This is basically some, the study of phenology. It is how everything reacts in relation to the climate that we're living in, depending on if you're a plant or an animal. And that's why phenology is so interesting because I'm starting to tie phenology in with what we're doing. And phenology is not something new, it's been around forever. So, you know, whether it's looking at apple blossoms, when apple trees are starting to bloom, I focus a lot on dandelions. When you look at alfalfa uh, heading out or, or flowering, we're starting to notice that obviously this happens at different times every year. So I started to track the grow and degree days of, of 
of dandelions and I've been tracking grasses on farm for years. And it's interesting how these things are starting to line up. So there's a lot of ways to look at how we should start cutting in the spring. We can look at the peak method with the peak stick. So people used to scissor cut quite a bit, but I focus more on growing degree days. Uh, this is a great chart out of Cornell looking at height and they utilize you know, how, how tall the alfalfa plant is and the percent of grass that's in the diet. And that will kind of tell you by alfalfa height when it's time to make your first cutting due to that grass stand that's in there. Uh, this is a really good way to do it, uh, but there's ways to kind of enhance that even a little bit more. And that's where growing degree days kind of come in. Manitoba does a great job with, green, with the green gold program. They're primarily alfalfa, but they look at the growing degree days, the RFV. They're doing a great job measuring and then also looking at growing degree days at the same time. So they, this is a really great program. So the, when I look at this, we've got the guys that chop on the 20th of every year and sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But I say you want this, this is, it's kind of like the Great Wall of China. Uh, you want to be on one side or the other. You usually make your forage early. And then what happens is usually that last week of May, first week of June, we get a good whack of rain. When we get that rainfall, some guys are done chopping first cutting before that rain comes. And then they can take advantage of the rain that comes and then heat comes in June. And that makes that plant really go. And then there's the other side of the fence where they go, oh, it's going to rain for a week. I think I'm going to wait till after that rainfall comes through at the end of May and then make my first cutting. Well, what typically happens is, is by the time everything settles down, that guy that had made their, their haylage prior to when that rain came for first cutting, he's making his second cutting probably about the same time that other guy's making his first cutting. And that guy that's making his first cutting is losing cuttings as you go. So it's very interesting to see that we know in this area, the part of the world that we're in, we're going to have that rain typically end of May, early June. So looking at a calendar really does not work. And that's why hitting this bullseye to me is so important um, because we want to be that farm that's getting it before that rain so they can take advantage of sequencing their cuttings for the rest of the year. So looking at growing degree days, when we look at base zero, that's when grasses start to grow. If we get three days in a row, um, three nights in a row of, of base zero or above, grasses will start to wake up. Usually that's around the March 1st to March 10th, depending on where we're at. I know the province is very big. So usually around that time, grass will start to wake up and alfalfa is base five. So there's quite a bit of difference between base zero and base five especially in early spring, because we get a lot of days that are going to sit in this base zero for grasses and not a lot that are going to sit in for alfalfa. And we know that base 10 is primarily for corn. So I look at cool season grasses as um, base zero, and these warm season grasses are going to be base five or base 10. And we're going to explain how you get to that number here in just a second. Um, I don't have this in Celsius, this is in Fahrenheit, but this is what growing degree days are. You will take the high temperature of the day, you add it to the low temperature of the day, and then you move on through, you will divide that by two, and then as you go up, you will have that number, and then from that base number, then you add from that. I don't expect you to sit down on a calendar or an Excel spreadsheet or, or write it on paper. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different websites and apps that are tracking growing degree days now. So I don't expect you to go through um, and look at that. But it's important to know. This is in Western New York. Uh, this is in North Java, New York, just actually about 30 minutes from Buffalo. This is at the same growing degree day every year. And 680 is kind of where you look at that 20, 30, 40 number for alfalfa, 20% protein, 30 ADF, 40 NDF, what most people consider prime alfalfa. To hit the 680 growing degree days, which is 360 Celsius, look at the difference between harvest dates. That date that hits 680 every year, I did this from 2009 till 2000, I think 18 or 19, 
And it's so interesting to see we've got basically a 15 day window of when we're hitting that same growing degree day every day. So that's super interesting. Normally, some areas you go to, they're really tight every year of when they normally harvest forage. But this area right here, there's a two week difference to get the same growing degree date number, which is pretty fascinating. And then you look at some areas like in, in New York, for example, that's a nice alfalfa area where you have a couple outlier years, but for the most part, everything is, is together. Um, when we look at different areas, I've kind of actually used, um, this is Mount Forest, Ontario. I kind of just use this place as a, as a typical area uh, because of where most of the cows are at in Ontario. I'm using Farm West. For this, look at the growing degree days and went in and tracked the growing degree days from 2012 um, all the way to 2020. So you'll notice that 2012 was a pretty, uh, pretty early year. And then when you look for Mount Forest, and this is for grass, the growing degree days for grasses, because you want to hit about 500 growing degree days for grasses, which we're going to talk about in a second. But you can see how tight that window is towards the end of the month. So actually, it's, it's interesting that we can play with these numbers and, and be pretty consistent with it. So how does this tie to dandelions? Well, if you don't remember anything I say from the talk today, besides this, I'm that weird dandelion guy. I'm, I'm not wearing uh, dandelion underwear or anything like that. And, and by the way, in researching this, don't look up dandelion underwear online. Uh, I made a mistake doing that, but... Um, it is what it is. But anyways, when you look at dandelions, not people track the growing degree days of dandelions, primarily the, the people that work with bees and then also our, our neighbors in the city that don't like dandelions in their yard. They track those growing degree days. So I found that when our growing degree days for dandelions line up, when we have dandelions that are that soft, that are that that yellow to soft white where the white is climbing up the bottom of that dandelion uh, bloom, when it's starting to go up and it gets really soft before it goes to seed, we should be going into the field and making our grass, our grass halages right when it's starting to get to that where the white is starting to climb up that, that dandelion blossom. That is right about the right time because I've looked at growing degree days in multiple areas over multiple years and I've started to notice that, and that is a really good trend to look at. So when we start to see that, most of the field needs, excuse me, needs to be starting to soften up and go to seed. And on its way to go into seed, that is when you need to be getting ready to start making your haylage or your first cutting, whether it's haylage or dry hay. A lot of people have known this. I think my grandfather used to tell me about this. And I'm sure everybody else's grandfather, and there's probably people in this, on this call that are, that are doing the same thing that have kind of looked at that. But we know when you look at some baleage or haylage and you see that soft white dandelion, and you, that's normally when you get that tacky, super soft, grassy feel to that. And you know, we know how well they eat this. So normally at a certain amount of growing degree days, we're going to get dandelions will start blooming. And then within probably two weeks, dandelions are going to go to seed. So we want to hit that window right before we go to seed. And that's when we should be starting to make our grass, our grass haylage. Uh, the picture up to the left here is kind of what I'm talking about. This is actually from a forage sample of one of my customers that does a great job harvesting forage. And they seem to hit that window every year. So you kind of go from that bloom out to seed. And you can look at the growing degree days to kind of match it up um, across the bottom. Obviously, that's the Celsius numbers. So I put this chart together a few years ago that kind of looks at growing degree days. I've got, I've got both Fahrenheit and Celsius on here as well. That's across the bottom. You can see the numbers. Typically, right around that, that 500 range, four, 450 to 500 range is when you're going to start to harvest that that early grass. And for you alfalfa folks out there, which I know there are some plenty of good areas up in Ontario that make alfalfa, you can look at the numbers and utilize this chart on when you should be making your alfalfa. And then in between that's the green uh, for mixed grasses. Um, 
And then winter cover crops, you're going to be a little bit earlier than grass because we know getting the rye and the triticale off, that's basically going to be almost a week prior to when those dandelions start to go to, to that, almost to that seed stage. And we can look at the growing degree days on that. And I've been tracking that for a couple of years. And one thing I've learned is clover, even though we know it's a legume and pretty similar to alfalfa on growing degree days, it's always been used as base 41. Some of the good work with from Tom Kilser, we're starting to figure out that actually clover is a little bit earlier. It's kind of in between grass and alfalfa. So it's just a tick earlier. So I think that's an interesting thing to look at. So this is a chart that I have put together primarily for Canada, uh, looking at the growing degree days for dandelions, grass, mixed and legumes, and kind of that sequence. And we look at whether you're using farm west, there's a bunch of different places you could look at to track your growing degree days. The most important thing is to find out, have a station that's close to your farm. That's a really important thing because we want to make sure the growing degree days that they're tracking for that location is really close to you. You can use Farm West. I'm sure there's other growing degree day trackers out there. I use US, uspest.org because there's a lot of growing degree day stations in Ontario that show up on that map as well. So I utilize that sometimes to triangulate uh, weather stations to where you're at. Farm West, this is the different stations that Farm West has um, throughout Ontario, just to kind of give you an idea. This year I took the, the growing degree days for Ontario for Ottawa, Kingston, Kempville, Coburg, Peterborough, me, 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 either Meaford or Mayford, Delhi, Mount Forest, Kitchener, and, and our friends up in Thunder Bay, which I haven't been there yet, but I'd certainly like to go up there sometime. But you can see the differences in the growing degree day lines. And that green line that goes across the top there, that's 500 growing degree days. That should be when your goal is to maximize that haylage quality and quantity. That's kind of hitting that window to get mid 60s in NDF digestibilities to low 70s though and get your NDF typically from that 45 to 50 range right in that range you're going to hit those numbers but it's interesting to see that green line that that climbs towards the top up and down in Delhi obviously they're in a completely different climate than our friends up in Thunder Bay when you look at that brown line across the bottom and then all these other areas out into eastern Ontario they're all kind of climb into that same number. So if you're close to these areas, you can probably kind of look and see where you were at this year and kind of say, okay, when did I make my feed and how close was I to that, to that date? And like I said, this will change every year, um, but it's definitely something to look at. But I just think it's fascinating to see how much difference we have in the provinces. Um, Looking at a little bit more information on Alora this year to hit that 500 growing degree days, uh, that was on May 27th. And if you're doing triticale or rye, that's going to be around, was around May 22nd. So there's about five day window between triticale and rye to hit a good digestibility number of 65 to 70, hitting that right then would have been a great deal. If you waited too long, then obviously those numbers are going to go down. But I just think it's interesting to look at this. So when we look at forage samples, obviously we look at dry matter, we look at crude protein, we look at ADF and NDF. I think we've all been trained to look at those numbers and that's normally where it stops. But what we need to be doing is looking at the NDF digestibility and then looking at the UNDF 240 because this tells us and is a good gauge of how well we're doing and if we're maybe missing the window by two to four days. And I think for the most part, that's what most places do is we miss the window for digestibility by about typically you know, three days to seven days. I'll use that as a better example. I think we're missing that. And by looking at our NDF D30, our UNDF 240, that will tell us how close we were to that window. And I'll explain why in here, here in a little bit. And then if you look at the relative feed value and RFQ, those are important to look at as well for quality. So these are just numbers that I think we should be looking at a little bit more. And we should be familiar with these numbers because they're basically numbers for param parameters for quality. So I like to have 
a lower NDF. I like to have a high NDF D30, which is that fast digestibility. Think of eating Chinese food versus a, a Thanksgiving dinner. One is going to go through you pretty slow. One's going to go through super fast. And then think of the low UNDF 240. We want to have that rate of passage. We want to have that feed get through that cow. So hitting that sweet spot is important because we can get the best of all those worlds. So one thing, that, another thing that you should remember is NDF typically increases about three quarters of a percent a day. So think about that for a second. If you have a certain NDF, it's going to increase three quarters of a percent a day for grasses. One thing that's very interesting to see is when we look at NDF digestibility, that's going to change one and a half to three percent a day. So that's pretty quick. That shows you that's basically you know, almost now primarily double what NDF is. So that shows you how quick that digestibility drops in that feed. And then UNDF 240 is another one that we're finally starting to track a little more. And I start to track quite a bit in my herds because as that, that NDF digestibility changes so much more rapidly than what the NDF DA30 is. This was a herd that I worked with in 2018. Um, we kind of had an argument, not an argument, but kind of a, a running bet. Um, I said, well, the growing, and this guy makes great forage in his own right. And I said, I think it's going to be ready on 518. He says, no, I think it's going to be ready on the 22nd. And I said, well, we got to really, you know, I said, I, I, I think it's going to be ready then. I said, but you can do what you want to do. I understand that. And he said, well, he says, I'll tell you what, I'll mow the field in half. He said, I'll mow half of it when you want to. And I'll mow the other half when, when I want to. And I'm like, well, that's fine. That's, that's actually fair. So if you look at the crude proteins, actually, they were about the same. This is a little strange of a sample that the crude protein was, was even um, or even a little bit higher in that four-day window. It's, it, I think it's just that was a sampling difference. But if you look at the NDF, uh, the NDF of in, on the 18th was 41. If you look at the NDF on the 22nd, it's 44. Kind of look at the way that number increases. You look at the NDF digestibility, it was 73 on the 18th, which is, I like to shoot for that 70, 72 down to 65. We want to shoot for that 65 to 72 range. And then the NDF D30 in four days, four days, dropped from 73, almost 74, down to 66, 67. But look what the NDF or UNDF 240 did. So remember, UNDF 240 is what we spread in the gutter. And Kendall had a great uh, comment two days ago talking about how he had one farm that talked about with his high quality feed that he didn't have as much manure as when he had this really high quality explosive stuff. And this is right here shows you why. When you look at the NDF, UNDF 240 going from 3%, 3.4% and four days later at 17, this might be an extreme um, because it is a little higher than what I normally see, but that gives you an idea how much that UNDF or how much of that undigestible fiber increases, especially in grasses. So that's why it's such an important thing. And I think these are the numbers under the numbers. This is the sweet spot within the sweet spot. There's a lot of us that make really good haylage but I think we can do just a little bit better to increase the digestibility and efficiency and the cows will thank you for that. Um, these two herds I work with very closely. Um, these are two different herds, not real close to each other really, they're about an hour apart, I would say. Um, but these are different samples. I took these from Cumberland Valley from the herds. These are over four five, six year period. You can look at the NDF digestibility that I have highlighted. These guys, you don't have to tell them when to chop. They're really usually always on top of it. And it's interesting that these are two different farms and look how close the NDF D30 is, 64 and 64. And look at the UNDF, 22 and 22. That's basically meaning that 80, their cows are utilizing 78% of that feed. And it's fascinating that both these herds, they don't know each other that well. I don't even think they know each other but they make the same type of feed. And these are two in my top five. And actually um, the newer 
numbers, the one herd to the left here, they're actually averaged 69 for the last two years. So they're really doing quite a good job with it. Um, looking at some of the summer annuals like VMR Sorghum Sudan, I've had a lot of herds starting to work with that a little bit more because the window for rye and triticale is so tough up north where we live. So looking at the NDF digestibility, a lot of times when people plant BMR sorghum Sudan, they're told to put it in the ground when it reaches 60 degrees, usually around the beginning of June, and then cut at around 45 days. Well, if you follow the days, that will not work because we all know that you're going to have different heats every single year, different amounts of rainfall, different amount of heat. So with that different amount of heat that you have, Sometimes you might have 35 days when it's going to be ready to go. That's why we've got to get out in the field and look. And then there's other times when it might be a tick longer. Um, this was planted oh, earlier, June 28th and August 3rd. And I've got the growing degree days there. This was done in Fahrenheit. I apologize. But the NDFD 30 was 77. Uh, we probably got that a touch early, but um, he wanted to get it off because rain was coming. And then obviously when the next time we, we chopped that was September 10th, and that was actually 43 days. So I didn't want, we, if you don't look at the days, that's better. You want to look at the growing degree days. So we matched about the same growing degree days on this BMR sorghum Sudan and see how close the NDFDs were. This was great feed that the cows ate like crazy. And sometimes we can feed BMR sorghum Sudan and it can get away from us. So we have to watch when the flag leaf is coming out, when that flag leaf is just starting to peak out. That's about the time we want to get into our BMR sorghum Sudan. And more often than not, it's going to match up to the date growing degree days. And it's going to match just right. I'll split a lot of stems on our BMR sorghum Sudan with a knife or a lot of small grains for that matter. And I'll look for where the, the heads are. And if the heads are within that two to four inches window of where they're starting to get up towards where the flag leaf is coming out, then I start to look at maybe it's time to go. So I like to do a lot of growing degree days, which is more analytical, but then I also like to get in the field. And, and a lot of fields, I'll actually go in and pre-cut the fields to make sure that those numbers are accurate. And then I can kind of tell, well, maybe I'm a little bit early this year, or maybe I might be a little, can wait a touch longer. Um, this cocktail mix, a lot of people are starting to use um, in the US and, and starting to look at it in Canada. Um, it's a combination of BMR, sorghum, Sudan, Italian ryegrass and clover. Kind of hits some of that cool season, some of the warm season, it kind of works together. And this seems to be a mix that's starting to pick up in, pick up quite a bit of popularity. But looking at it, you'll get that same situation where you have the NDF digestibilities are going to be really high if you follow the, the growing degree days with this, with this really well. Uh, one thing we, we looked at is we all know that last cutting of the year, uh, it's, it's almost like smoke and meat for a lack of a better word, because it seems like no matter how many growing degree days we have or how many days on the calendar, that last cutting seems to just sit, sit and sit. It grows real nice, but digestibility sits there and it just likes that, that more moderate temperature, especially with grasses. And you'll see the NDFD 30 on this stuff was 79. But when you look at the chart right here, as this goes, I track the growing degree days out after that and you can see how rapidly the growing degree days increase and that digestibility I feel would have gone down, but it, it, would, it would have gone down a little bit faster if we would have done that in the summer. So really that last cutting, you have a little bit of room and then sometimes you have that room with first cutting like we did this year because we had such a great year. We had that micro like, I equate it this year's first cutting, which was really digestible. I equate that to, when we have a piece of chicken in the, and we want to put it in the microwave to cook it, to heat it back up, if we cook it at full power, it's rubbery and we could bounce it off the wall. But if we cook it at half power, typically then it's going to be juicy and still tender. And that's kind of the, what we had for first cutting this season. We kind of had that slow, slow digestibility that was really good for this year's crop. So even if you missed the window this year, you did 
pretty well. So I look at it as a game of chicken with mother nature. You have to know what the forecast is. You have to look at your growing degree days. You have to walk into the field and see where you're at. Um, Triticale, we'll talk about this really quick. Um, I like to stay away from what I'll call um, centerfold or pinup forages. Um, sometimes we can get too ridiculous and, and get too close or too quick to cut. When we're hitting that 80 NDFD 30, um, it, it's great for the World Forage for the uh, Forage Super Bowl. I, that's great because it is a good thing. Sometimes I worry if we if we try to get these super super hot numbers, if we do lose a little bit on tonnage. And to me, that's pretty important because it's great to have great quality feed that the cows run out of right away and eat super great. But if we don't have enough feed inventory, so that's why I kind of try to hit that that 65 to 72 range on NDF digestibility and try to hit that 45 to 50 range on NDF for grasses. Because if you look at this sample, it's for triticale, it's at 41. So to me, this was made a little bit too early. It's a beautiful forage sample, a uh, gorgeous forage sample. Um, but really, I, I, you know, I sometimes worry be, we might be leaving a little bit of tonnage on the, on the table with these centerfold forages. Getting close to finishing here, I utilize a lot of this forage analytics on corn silage as well. And I think there's as much advantage, I think, is looking at these analytics and pre-harvesting forages for haylage. Boy, is there an opportunity with corn silage to look at your growing season. Most every farm I go to, I will look at a, um, uh, a growing degree day calculator like this. I'll ask when you chopped or when, when, or not, sorry, when you plant. And then I'll also ask, when do you like to plant and when do you really plant? Because typically it's normally two weeks off when you really want to plant, but when you get into the field is sometimes a different thing. So we have to look at when you actually get into the field and plant. And then I also ask them, when do you chop and when do you like to chop? And everybody says, oh, they like to chop around the end of, you know, the end of September or the middle of September, but real, realistically, when do you chop? Well, October, October 15th, somewhere in that range. So I like to look at the grow and degree day window that you have in a historical average and see where your playing field is because most farms are out kicking their coverage to use a football term. They're planning a little bit too long a day thinking that they're going to get more tonnage and what happens is, is typically they run up against frost and their corn doesn't finish. And obviously starch is a vital part of corn silage. So this is a whole nother topic we could have. And I've spent a lot of time talking with, with farms and doing webinars on corn silage analytics that works really well. So kind of to summarize this real quick, um, we talked about that PEUNDF number. So if you have higher digestibility forages, if you're making this early, early growing degree days about 500 and you have real high digestibility, you can get away with cutting your chop a touch longer. If you have low digestibility, if you know you missed the window, if these early rains came in and you're shaking your head because you can't get into the field, you want to cut that shorter because we know that the NDF digestibility and the NDF are high all the research now that we're focusing on now and over the next five years is looking at the NDF digestibility and whether it's gonna be cut long or cut short because we wanna have, if it's low digestibility, cut it shorter, high digestibility, we can cut it longer. Wetter, we wanna cut it longer because we wanna have less affluent, drier. You wanna have a shorter chop. You wanna make sure if you're on corn silage, for example, above 36% dry matter, you want to cut her down a little bit shorter, um, and especially looking at the NDF digestibility part of the equation. Um, use nature. I look at dandelions a lot, and you're going to think I'm nuts until you start doing it at home. Don't look at the dandelions that are up against the house or up against the barn or facing the sun. Look at your whole field. And when they start to kind of wilt a little bit and the white starts to creep up that dandelion, then it is time to go for your grass, put the planter away and go and get your grass because you wanna set up that schedule 
cutting schedule for the rest of the year, especially with grasses. Uh, Pre-harvest cuttings, I'm doing this a lot more lately is I'm actually finding a, uh, a, a normal spot in the field that's pretty relative. And then I will chop, cut that at four inches and then send that feed sample into the lab at about a week before I'm guessing I'm gonna make feed because I wanna look at the NDF and the NDF digestibility so I can triangulate and make sure that the growing degree days are right on. Sometimes we're gonna be a tick early. A lot of times I notice that guys that hit the growing degree day window real great on first cutting, what happens is, is they hit that rain, they get the heat from early June, and then what happens is a second cutting is typically starting to head out if they wait 30 days. But remember, we don't necessarily want to wait 30 day schedule because what I've found over the last three or four years is second cutting is usually 24 to 27 days on those guys that cut real early because they got the, the speed up because of the rainfall and that heat and that, that crop sped up along a little bit and usually your tonnage is, is pretty good as well. This method works really well with, with triticow and cereal forages and summer annuals. It helps triangulate and especially with cereal forages and summer annuals like BMR sorghum Sudan, they can get away from you in a heartbeat, especially rye. So you wanna make sure that you hit that when you need to. Um, know your NDFs, get to know these numbers and embrace them. Embrace them as a farm because this is how quality is gonna be. Don't make it a beauty contest. Hit that 65 to 72 NDF D30 or that, that 45 to 50 NDF number because it's not necessarily a beauty contest because I don't want to see us lose inventory. And if forage makes up 70% of the diet, that, you know, this, is, this is pretty important to make sure we look at that because if we have a higher haylage diet, we're going to want to make our haylage quality better. If we have a lot higher corn silage diet, we can probably let the haylage go a touch, but you've got to make sure you know what's going on with the, with the diets. Um, even with the quota, obviously, um, far forage quality to me is, is the most important thing, but be traditional and modern, go out in the field, but use these, these um, data pieces that we have or these apps on growing degree days that we have, so. Uh, that is pretty much all I have. I don't know how I was on time, um, but I'm open for questions and I'm, I'm willing to be around as long as you need me, Christine. All right. Well, we are a little bit over on time, but it was such a fascinating topic and such an interesting approach to balancing hay quality and yield that uh, I'll let you go a little long. So right. what we're going to do is we're going to field two questions now, then I'll pass it back to Terry to do the formal wrap up, but John's going to stick around after the formal wrap up and we'll do more questions then so that you guys do have a chance to get your questions answered. Um, so John, the first question that I have for you is with, with your talk, you focused a lot on dairy operations because you predominantly work with dairy operations, right. but is this approach also applicable to beef and sheep producers? So I work with a, with a, with a sheep producer here in the States um, that, uh, they're averaging, they're, they're lactating sheep are averaging about eight and a half pounds, which take that to kgs. That's a big whack of milk, right? <laughs> yes, it is. Big whack. And they said that they get some of their, um, they get peak production between 12 and 16 pounds on sheep, which just blows your mind. I mean, that's, that's a 40 to 50,000 pound herd and, you know, for cows. And to me, when you look at sheep, that is super important to have that, even that higher quality forage. It's an interesting story. I was talking to that producer and they told me that there's something magical about dandelions. The protein in the dandelions is just so outstanding. There's something about dan. but here what it is, is the kind of unison with our talk, they're hitting that window just right when they're letting them out on pasture. And that, that's why they're seeing that advantage. So with, with, with small ruminants, I think it's super vital. I think with beef cattle, it's you know important as well. We have to obviously maintain. We don't want to go too early. We want to make sure we fill them up, and it depends on how much grains going into the diet versus forage. If they're really forage heavier based, 
then we want to make it earlier because you want to get them to finish quicker. You want that rate of passage to increase. A lot of times I've seen beef producers where they're feeding more, more forage, but the forage isn't real good and they complain because they don't finish. So, okay. you know, it depends on what you're looking at. Okay, but yes, the, the, the principles seem like they'd apply regardless of what ruminants you're feeding. It's, very it's cool. Very universal. <laughs> um, another question that came in is when it comes to timing the harvest for hay mixtures that have a variety of species in them, how do you, how do you time that to get that optimal point? And, and should we be planting single species hay stands? Is it, is it impossible to do or how do you do that? It's a, that's a wonderful question that could take four hours of, and, and a couple drinks. Um, but it, it's, it's the way I look at it simply is some of us have alfalfa ground and some of us have grass ground. And if you have really great alfalfa ground and you do a great job with alfalfa and you don't have a lot of winter kill, plant your alfalfa. Um, a lot of times where people get into trouble is they'll plant a lot of meadow fescue, tall fescue, some of these earlier uh, maturing varieties, and then they plant alfalfa and they have that mixture together and they either chop their alfalfa too early to catch their grass, or when they start to get a few blooms in their alfalfa, their grass is blown out. So Sometimes I look at it, I've had this happen lots of times where if they're on a little bit heavier, not as conducive to alfalfa ground, I will kind of lean towards that. Why don't we just go with grasses? Because you're going to get more digestibility out of it um, than that. You're not going to get as much winter kill. Uh, so I will tend to go, if you're more grassy ground that supports grass ground, go with grass. If you're more alfalfa, go with alfalfa. alfalfa. I do put mixes together for people that are meadow fescue, tall fescue, and if they want a little bit of orchard grass, I'll, I'll utilize an LM or, a, excuse me, a late maturing orchard grass to kind of spread that out a little. So it can be done. You just have to be real careful and work with your agronomist and seed salesman to kind of make sure you hit that, that blend exactly right, because it's super frustrating. So it's possible, but the management is harder. It, it's exactly right. Yeah, I should have just said that. Would have, would have answered <laughs> that <laughs> no, that was a great answer. The context is is what's really valuable here. So I'm going to pass things over to Terry to do our, our formal end of webinar stuff, but John and yeah. I are sticking around afterwards so that we can get more of your questions answered because, um, yeah, I know there's, there's lots of good questions coming in and sure. I know personally, I want to pick John's brain a little bit further. So I'm um, here all night. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Terry, you can, you can take it away. All right. Thank you, John. That was excellent. Lots of information and I'm looking forward to hearing the questions myself as well. And at this time, I'd like to thank our sponsors again uh, for the support for putting on these webinars, uh, the Dairy Farmers of Ontario. We appreciate your support, Kubota Canada Limited, Ontario Sheep Farmers, um, and today's sponsors we were brought to you today by Growmark Inc., SGS Canada Laboratories, and Belle Isle Solution Nutrition Inc. So we appreciate all the, the businesses and organizations that have helped sponsor our event, so that's much appreciated. And a big thank you goes out to Christine O'Reilly. She's done a lot of behind the scenes work to put this all together. Things have run really smooth for our, our first experience into the forage focus virtually, so appreciate your efforts. And as well to Patricia Ellingwood and the staff at the Ontario Forage Council, we appreciate all the efforts for this as well. Michelle Lyington, uh, John Winchell, we appreciate you here uh, to take the time to speak with us today as well. So much appreciated and uh, good job to everyone that's helped put this together. So look forward to, to your questions here and uh, that's a wrap from the Forage Council. All right, so we've had a few more questions come in. Um, when you're counting growing degree days on a spring seeded crop, do you count from the date of planting or emergence? I, I typically count from the day of emergence uh, because, you know, sometimes the crop just doesn't come out of the ground, whether it's rainfall or other reasons. So I like to count from emergence uh, just because to me, that's a little more. Some people like to do it the other way. And, and a spike on corn, for example, if you look at corn, 
you need a hundred growing degree days basically to get it out of the ground for, for our base. And if you plant it and put it in the ground at the end of April and your growing degree days don't hit a hundred till end of May, it's still not going to come out of the ground till the end of May. So you need to have that. So I think emergence is better. Okay. And for those crops that overwinter, so like our alfalfa, our perennial grasses, uh, mm -hmm. when do you start counting your growing degree days in a production year? I start typically March 1st. Um, there are other areas in, in the country, but obviously living in, in where we do in Ontario and New York, March 1st seems to be the good date. Um, it, some could argue it's March 1st, it's March 10th, March 15th, but you're only going to accumulate a small amount of growing degree days prior to March. And you're only going to grow, you know, start, you really start accumulating numbers around that March 1st to March 10th number. So I use March 1st pretty much in the Northeast. Okay. Thank you. Um, what are your opinions on harvesting Harvextra alfalfa, the low lignin alfalfa? So far, I, you know, I had fears initially, probably like everybody else that I thought um, that I thought Harvextra or, or any of these other types of low lignans that we would lose, you know, the, the crop would fall over a little bit, or I would worry about lodging. I have not seen that in most everywhere I've been. I have not seen it. I like it because it does, you know, it does give you the ability to either chop early and get super feed, or it does have that stall to it, almost like, you know, the smoke and meat comparison I used earlier. Alfalfa, low, uh, probably uh, nobody's ever said that before. But that's a pretty good one. Alfalfa will, you know, low lignin alfalfa will stall a little bit right in that stage, and then it'll give you that opportunity. So I, I really like low lignin alfalfa. The only thing I would would really say is if you have uh, BMR corn silage and low lignin alfalfa, you better have some straw with it typically, because I've seen personally a few situations where you have 25% low lignin alfalfa and rocket fuel BMR, and all of a sudden intakes increase, manure gets loose, fat test drops, and you're like, oh no. So, so, so both of those are traits that lower the lignin content. So combining them can have unintended dietary consequences. Yeah, you just have to add some straw in as a governor. You got to use it as a float or a governor. But okay. yeah, low lignin, I, lo I really have been pretty happy with it so far. Okay. Um, in your opinion or in your experience, is there a financial benefit to identifying that sweet spot between yield and quality? Um, yeah, I think a financial benefit, you said? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, because, you know, we want to make sure we get the most out of our crop, but yet we don't want to buy grain from the feed mill. So we want to make sure when we hit that sweet spot, we're either lowering some money that's coming in from the grain, from the feed mill, whether it's on the protein side of things, or a lot of these times on these, we shoot for 60% forage diets to 65 to even 70% on some farms. Now we're running 70% forage and the higher the forage quality, the better the sweet, the more you hit that sweet spot, the actual less amount of money you're going to have to bring in from out of pocket cost. So uh, off farm costs. So yeah, to me, I think there is a good fen beneficial uh, financial influence. I don't have the exact numbers and I suppose we could easily put that together, but yeah, I think there's a definite advantage. Okay. Um, do you think there's a benefit to having a forage crop tested for its insilability potential before cutting um, rather than just relying on a visual assessment of the crop? I used to say no, but I can't tell you how many times in the last three or four years working with consultants, feed mills, farms, and my own farms where pre-cutting, pre-harvesting forage has made such a dramatic difference on the quality because there are times, especially with the summer annuals and sometimes with triticale, I do a ton with triticale or rye rye can be kind of rye can be squirrely she's pretty sneaky and when i say she's pretty sneaky 
it's going to be ready a tick earlier than triticale. And sometimes, even if you look at the growing degree days, your window on rye is, is minuscule for digestibility. So I like to pre-cut maybe a week or, or 10 days before I think I'm going to harvest. And just look at that. I, I spent a lot of time this year looking at pre-harvesting and looking at the growing degree days and looking at the digestibility of individual forages. And then I waited a week and chopped them again you know, and saw what they were in a week's time. So I think, yeah, pre-harvesting is really important. I mean, I guess the nutritionist probably won't care as long as you don't get too carried away. But I, I think it's super important because there are times, especially like second cutting, when you're looking at the field and you're thinking, oh, she's shorter than she is. She needs to be, I'll just let her grow. Mm -hmm. And then you take a look at the digestibility by pre-harvesting and you're like, oh boy. So in other words, then you get a stall and poor quality. Right. So you, you're better off just to go get it. So yeah, pre-harvesting to me is, is something that we're going to be doing more and more of. Okay. Um, do crop stress conditions affect that growing degree day accumulation? So things like too much rain, drought, insect pressure. What was that? I, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I lost you for a sec. Go ahead. Um, crop stressors. Yep. Does that affect growing de degree days or does it affect the accuracy of the model, I think might be a better way to put it. Yeah, I think it won't affect the growing degree days necessarily, but I think it'll affect the digestibility of the crop. We've learned that in corn silage that in corn silage, for example, you build your digestibility from emergence to tassel and then she becomes a reproductive plant. And a lot of that digestibility is built then with haze kind of the same or grasses are the same way. If we have a real wet, wet pattern of weather, it's going to lower the digestibility. And we've seen research over and over that shows if you have a wet, wet, wet and hot, your digestibility is going to go down. Mm -hmm. If you have, you know, cooler and dry conditions, your digestibility like this last year will go up. So Okay, we had a comment come in. Um, one viewer is surprised that meadow fescue is one of your main recommendations for mixtures with alfalfa. Um, it's very common for mixtures available in Ontario, like pre-blended mixtures to see yep. tall fescue, late orchard grasses, uh, mostly because of yield and quality. Um, right. I know lately I've seen a lot more interest in those meadow fescues for the quality component, but yep. do you want to elaborate a bit more on, on why you're using meadow fescue with your clients? Yeah, and, and most of my meadow fescue are going to be situations where it's more of a grass-oriented diet, uh, more for that grassy ground. Um, if you're going to be predominantly growing alfalfa, then some of these later maturing orchard grasses and tall fescue you know, they are going to be closer matched to that alfalfa. So I think if you, it depends on the situation. If you have more of an alfalfa area, then you might stay away from meadow. But if it's more of a grass mixture, um, I throw meadow in just because I like the digestibility of, of meadow fescue compared to tall. Um, tall can go crazy and, and, you know, you get tonnage, but sometimes the digestibility is not there. So I think it depends on the percent of alfalfa you're looking at in your stand. Okay, thanks. Um, we had a question come in about grazing. Do you have much grazing experience? Um, no, I really, I, <laughs> I, I don't, I haven't, but I do say one, okay, I do and I don't. How about that? Okay, we might field this one together then because grazing is more my background. So we'll see no, how, how yeah. we go with this. Well, let's um, yeah, so, so go ahead, the, your side. Well, the question is, how would you target peak forage quality in a rotational grazing system? So would you be turning livestock out maybe earlier than ideal so that your last paddock is not over mature or like how, how would you manage that kind of thing? I will, I'll let you do the pasture part. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's... It is always tricky because every year is a little different, but if if the pasture is dry enough, like if you've got an early paddock that can carry the stock without punching it up too badly, then yeah, probably going in a little early helps. If you can't get in early, then mowing is a fantastic quality management tool. Ideally, if you can take what you mow for, for baleage or for haylage, that's, that's a bonus because you've got more stored feed. Um, but yeah, it's it's a tough one to balance and there's there's 
a few different approaches. It could go early if you've got early ground, it might be right on time and be prepared to mow to keep the quality up because for a grazing system, we're really trying to keep that grass as vegetative as possible for as long as possible. And I see a lot of people around me that, that I work with that do graze too. And um, they're supplemental grazing, not complete grazing, but, but, you know, I've seen them take them out, put them out too early and they just, they just beat it up and punch it up. And you're like, Oh, that was a real nice, it was a nice stand. But then I also look at, I sat in on a webinar where people are, um, were green chopping all year long. Mm -hmm. They start green chopping early in the spring and then just green chop through November. And it's interesting to look at, they gave me the information, which I thought was awesome because a nerd like me likes that stuff. So I started looking at, they were talking about 15, you know, 10 to 15 cuttings a year. They were just talking about this extreme number. And it depends on where you're living too. More mm -hmm. us, we might have less. But it was fascinating that on their 10 to 12 cutting schedule, they were cutting basically around 50, you know, 20 to 23 days, 24 days. And I looked at the growing degree days and they, and I looked at two different farms and they were like bang on almost exact with growing degree days on their green chopping. So they were hitting the numbers just right. It was wow. like it blew my mind that it actually worked like that. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's amazing that it was that consistent. Yeah. And that Kendall, uh, Kendall had that information about the, um, about those real super great forage samples, the forage Super Bowl winning type of forages. Those were the numbers that I was seeing with those herds that were, that were um, green chopping. It was that's a zero that grade system. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, do you think there's a place for reed canary grass in a forage mix and would it make great hay? Um, dry hay or, 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 or haylage, um, depends. Um, I don't work a lot with reed, reeds canary. It makes a decent feed. I don't have a problem with it. It works fine in haylage. Sometimes in dry hay, it can get a little funky and they don't eat it as well. But like I said, I don't work with it as much, but I, I do have mixes of customers where they're using reeds and getting by just fine with it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's seems to fit in the middle in that digestibility. It can be an interesting one to manage. If it gets over mature, it, the leaves tend to get very coarse and that's unpalatable, um, right. but it's got a massive root system. So, I mean, it's it's got a reputation for being tolerant of, of very slow draining soils, but because it's got a big root system, it's also very tolerant of droughty soils. So from a management perspective, you can stick it in a lot of places where other grasses maybe won't do as well, but um, it's hard to keep the quality up if it's on that late ground because it once once it's coarse, most livestock don't like to eat it right. as much. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you manage quality in that cocktail mix you mentioned? So it's a warm season sorghum sedan grass, which is a base 10 Celsius growing degree day. And you've got Italian ryegrass, which some people may be more familiar with it being called annual ryegrass, but it's, yeah. it's a cool season and yep. it's on a base zero Celsius growing degree yep. day. So like they're developing at very different speeds. How do you manage quality in that cocktail mix? So it's interesting. I know the, um, the person that really works on it is, um, a lot in the U S is a Daniel Olson. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he he's from Wisconsin. Uh, we work a decent amount together and this was kind of the cocktail mix was kind of his, his thing where he was combining a cool seasons and warm seasons together. What I like to do is primarily with the BMR Sorghum Sudan, that first cutting is going to be mostly BMR Sorghum Sudan and a touch of Italian ryegrass. And if you have dry years, you're not going to see it. And then the clover's there as well. So usually you, I, I really look at the BMR Sorghum and try to hit it at that 13 to 14 and that's for Fahrenheit. So I'd have to adjust it for, uh, for Celsius, but okay. I can get you that, but yeah, you have to, I look at focus for BMR sorghum for the first, and then I kind of know that the BMR sorghum is going to back off. And then I try to manage it for the, uh, ryegrass and clover after. Okay. And we've got, <laughs> we, we've got one that's come in as a, a final fun question. Uh, with no more TB12 to worry about, will the Bills win their division? Yeah, I would assume they probably will. <laughs> I hope they will at least. 
I was a Browns fan because I used to live in Ohio. So I moved to Buffalo, but my wife wouldn't have married me if I didn't become a Bills fan. So yeah, I think they probably will. This is football we're talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> I thought so. I was pretty sure that Bills was Buffalo Bills, but I, I yep. had to ask. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much again, John, for staying on with us a little longer and answering some additional questions. And thanks to all of you who stuck around with us. Um, yeah, it's it's been a great afternoon and, and I think a successful Forge focus overall. So um, thank you, everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all at Profitable Pastures in March. Details will be out soon. <laughs> all right. Take care, everybody. Thank you.